this panel, stay out of trouble, seven key steps an employer needs to take on Trump's Buy American, Hire American executive order. Again, if you know you're on this panel, come on up. We do have limited time. We're trying to uh, make up a little bit of time from earlier. Rohit, if you would like to come up, you'll be leading the panel. Again, he is partner with Fakuri Law Group. Next will be um, Satya Prakash, Senior Manager, Global People Movement at Sapient. I'd like to have you come up. Satya brings 27 years of immigration experience and mobility, developing policies, processes, and best practices. He's also worked for many years in the consular, um, in a role at U.S. Embassy, New Delhi, and also with the Ghana High Commission, probably 16 years between those two places. He enjoys rafting, cricketing, and football, all of the fun things to do. Yeah, great guy. We've got um, also uh, Ravi is here. And we have Ravi Shankar. And thank you for being on the panel with us today. No? No? Yes. Ah, now you can. Thank you. Well, so we're going to have something simple over here. We've got Ravi R at that end, and we've got Ravi S at this end. So we're going to deal with Ravi R and Ravi S. Satya is very easily positioned. So um, you've heard so much through the day, through the two days, and you've been educated so much. I'm hoping that you guys have spent quite a bit of time getting some questions together. So we'd like to make this really, really interactive and try and get your questions. You've got all these expert brains and experienced people out here. Ask your questions. I think that's what I would like to offer at this point. I also like the idea of the client interaction because it just helps everybody to learn. When people ask questions, everybody else who's thought of the question but didn't ask the question also benefits. So please get your questions rolling in whatever format INS Zoom wants you to do it so that we can get that uh, panel going. We can, I think I'm gonna, let's see, let me figure this one out. Okay. Now, bef this is just a general agenda. I, uh, we do have an agenda. I'm gonna just read some highlights that I'd like to, but before that, I think I have a bit of a surprise item to kind of hopefully lighten the mood a little bit over here. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself volume, and for his regime. How do you think those words will be received by President Kim Jong-un? Today at the UN, the imperialist dog Trump launched a pop-based attack calling me Rocket Man, a reference to Elton John's 1972 hit single. This is ridiculous. I would have gone with the Gap bands, you dropped a bomb on me. But if Trump wants an Elton John insult off, Un will bring the heat. That is why tonight, I am proud to introduce my new parody album, Goodbye Yellow Haired Toad, Kim Jong Un reimagines the hits of Elton John to mock Trump. You'll hear all the righteous zingers like Hold Me Closer Tiny Hand Sir, Come Over in the Wind, Saturday Night's All Right for Golfin, and Someone Change My Wife Tonight. All right, so hopefully we all get the message at this point in time and uh, you know, my friend and colleague Anandita is outside but that video was essentially meant for her. But any case, okay, so I'm gonna just read out some highlights, but please get your questions going. Your questions get priority over anything else that I'm going to read, so please ask your questions. Again, the, you've all heard about the presidential executive. You've heard about what it has and what it doesn't have. Um, it's more about what it doesn't have, actually, that's more troubling, but in any case, let's see what we can talk about over here. Uh, he clearly wants to raise the wages. I don't think there's any question about that. If we look at it, and I'm not gonna read this whole thing out to you because you can read it as well as I can, but just some portions over there. Executive order states in order to create 
higher wages and employment rates for workers in the United States and to protect their economic interests, it shall be the policy of the executive branch to rigorously enhance and administer the laws governing entry into the United States of workers from abroad, including Section 212A5 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. This follows and is in accordance with the notices found in memoranda from DOL, DOJ, and DHS, where the various agencies announced that they would impose greater scrutiny on the H-1 program. I think that's what we've all been discussing over the last two days. So I'm going to start off with asking some questions to my panelists over here, because we're all struggling with answers. There are no clear answers, but certainly we can brainstorm together and come up with possibly good, successful resolutions. Um, Satya, let's start off with you. Obviously, we're talking about compliance over here. We're talking about compliance, compliance, compliance. I think that's probably been the most commonly used word over the last two days over here. Can you give us a sense of what that means to you at your organization in terms of where does it begin for you? When does it start and how do you work with that? And then we'll take the two Ravis at hand as well. Sure, Rohit. So I think that's the key, even if you, uh, what you just read uh, at the order. So what he's trying to implement the Trump is basically whatever has been legislated. And I see few changes being done, but like yes, most have been put up at Congress, but uh, still hasn't uh, been the law. And we are struggling. So he is trying to make even what was law earlier is, is it, kind of being abided. And he wants to ensure that it is closely going to be abided. So starting with his buy American and hire American, so what he's trying to do is, hey boy, be careful if you are bringing in people from outside, which is HAS and ALS, to work in the US, make sure you are compliant, otherwise you are in trouble. Uh, so for me, because Whatever I do in sense of immigration and deploying people, it becomes so, so important for me because my entire organization can lose a license to sponsor, and which means there is going to be no business at all. Am I going to take that risk? The answer is no. So the key for me is, uh, I think I heard that earlier in one of the panels, I think it was uh, Rohit Yu again, so we were discussing there, hey, I'm 60% compliant, I'm 70%, 80%, 90%, but here is we need to be 100% because even if there is 1%, 10% which is missed, it opens up a whole can of investigation. And do we really or are we prepared to go into that? Because then the investigators who come and look at the documents, then they will ask secondary evidences and go so on and so forth, and it opens up a whole lot of things. So in my sense, the key is, of course, the compliance, and I do whatever, I have to shout at whoever, I have to go to whoever in terms of my leadership, is, hey, this is going to be the key, this is going to be the priority, and I really can't expect to miss, I cannot take a chance on that, and having said that, it will enable businesses decide and take a better decision in terms of whatever businesses they are anticipating or they are seeing in the future. Thank you. Um, Ravi R, since you come before us, question for you. Um, you know, picking up from what Satya just said to us, obviously there are business interests that sometimes clash with the immigration conflicts and there are gray areas. How do you work with that? I think that's a great question, uh, Rohit. The, the gray areas is what defines where we step in, compliant or non-compliant, right? I think when it's black and white, people tend to follow it. You have a minimum salary, you know you will follow it. You don't have it, then you have the prevailing wage. Then you're discussing what you want to give on for other. L1, you never know what you want to do. I think. This is where you need to go back and look at. So if you look at companies, uh, the larger corporations, they tend to be more compliant oriented. They wouldn't tend to take risks. But it is for the companies and for them to talk to their attorneys, ask their experts to see what is the appetite for risk. 
because this is a gray area. So you do not know. You ask the consulates, I think every time you ask, you have a very indirect answer. You never get a direct answer as to why I reject a visa, right? So it's a simple thing. It is gray. So you will need to say, do I have an appetite for risk to go to that extent and say, I, it's a minimum salary. I will pay exactly the minimum salary. I'll pay 3,000 more or do something else to save it on the taxes. This will depend on what you want to do, one. And to just go back to uh, the point Satya uh, mentioned, it's very important to explain this to the business for them to make a decision. We get to become non-compliant because we are forcing to do something because the business wants it. Not that I want it or the team wants it because the business is pushing for it. So if you're going back and explaining it to them, this is what it is, this is the consequence, and we are not going to take this risk. It enables them to make the decision on where do we want to lean, to the left or the right. I think that actually you, sem you summed it up very well in your morning session when you said you should get a seat on that C-suite because I think you guys need to be able to guide them and talk to the management and let them know what the challenges are that you are facing because without that, uh, you're working blind. Uh, Ravi, your turn. Okay. Your thoughts on the same issue yeah, so about I'm, how I'm you... I'm ready with the answer, so... Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, I just want to say, so on, on, on the thing, so what was complaints earlier and what is complaints today? Um, especially in the context of US, if I, if I have to say. Um, so probably earlier is, is I was uh, reading between the lines. And, and probably these days reading between the tweets. So, uh, so there's, there's, again, it leads to the gray area where uh, you know, uh, Ravi was adding here. Uh, so again, where there is a gray area, what do I do now, right? Uh, and, and Ravi rightly put it that uh, you know, even if you go to the consulate or even if you go to the uh, you know, experts, uh, the, the answer still remains the same, it's a gray. Uh, but still business has to move on and, and it has to happen and, and we have to help the business. So, so the option that I have is, is probably to take a position, okay? To me, I feel or my understanding of the requirement or, or the objectives behind that or what could be the law of the land is intending to be and take a position and, and, and move on, right? So I cannot stop the engine. So we will go on with the engine and take a position and go ahead and then we will see what happens. Really, that's a decision that I would take. So let me be a little contrary over here. Clearly, I think more than the gray area, what we're seeing in terms of compliance directives, aren't they coming down more or less as black and white and actually being much harder? Ravi R. Uh, so I, I don't think it's always black and white. So you come back, if you ask, why did you really give an L1? Give me an explanation. Is there a clear demarcation when I'll pay an uh, L1 category? You don't have it. You have guidelines. The guidelines is there. The guidelines interpretation is different so if i look at the uscis and you guys as firms know it better when you speak to the uh, case workers each one of them have their own interpretation of what the guidelines mean so from a compliance perspective i'm not only talking about us if you get into a port of entry anywhere speak manila i will get through from one officer the other officer will hang me up to dry for the same reason so these are guidelines and that is where we say that's a gray area. It's black and white, but it's still gray because how you interpret it is up to you. You speak to your attorneys, they give you one interpretation. Do I take it? Yes, I do from a corporate uh, perspective. If you are not clear, we go back and say, hey, what do you think as experts? This is what it is. Then it's for us to decide, do I follow that or still go with the risk that I would do from a business perspective. So I have a question for each of you as a black and white answer, either yes or no. So is your level one computer program or is that a black and white answer or is that a gray? Who I wants to be first? I for myself and some of the corporation. We don't even go in for a level one. And where we spoke today morning and I was speaking to the team also, they said it crept up us on 31st of March. But you were mentioning that. It was always out there, sounded off, that's going to come in. So nothing was a surprise, right? We knew it in Jan when we were planning for these stages. That's going to come and we went back, checked, we said we're not doing level one. We're not even going to be worried about it. So if people still went ahead and submitted a level one, then I'm going to say they took the 
risk to do it. So your answer is the third answer that we give immigration sometimes, NA, not applicable. Okay, Satya, what about you, yes or no? Usually, uh, we uh, as a corporation are not uh, very much uh, H-1B dependent. So, uh, to me, I don't know, uh, I will say is maybe not. Okay, you came up with the fourth answer. Okay, Ravi S, yes. what about you? One of you has got to give me a clear yes, no. I have the fifth one, half white, half black. <laughs> all right, so that's obviously up for discussion, and I think we've all seen that entire discussion happening, and I think one of the points that uh, James had brought up earlier as well was one of the ways that you can qualify is if you have a bachelor's degree, and that's in the law. So my gut feeling is there's going to be some level of litigation. It just depends on which company is willing to push the envelope and challenge the immigration on that, because clearly the law says that if you need a bachelor's degree for the position, you have an H-1B. So now does that memo from the immigration override the law? I think not, but it's going to be left to be seen. I'm sure that's going to be tested and challenged along the way. So we have two questions. We'll take that because the clock seems to be moving a lot faster than I thought, and it seems like we have only four minutes left, which also means the clock's uh, running down for your questions, so please let it come. Uh, first question says, as the H-1B work visas are getting difficult to come by for entry-level jobs, for freshly qualified individuals, investor visas have shot into the limelight. Um, our firm, and I do a lot of EB-5 cases, we do a substantial amount, and that's one of the reasons why I spend so much time in India right now. I don't think you can compare the two, because the investor visa, as most of us know, requires an investment of a minimum of half a million US dollars. Uh, without going into details, I think it's not a fair comparison to say that that's an alternative to the H-1B. If it is an alternative to the H-1B, that's great for the individual, but it's not an alternative for the company, because the EB-5 is an in individual investment visa, uh, and it's not just an investor, it's got to create jobs. So I'm not getting into details over here, but I'm not sure that that's a fair comparison over there. Second one, Ravi S. how can we advocate for sensible immigration policies with Trump? Let's hear each of your views on that, please. Sure. Uh, the words that are important over there are sensible and Trump. Uh, no, it's, it's a very valid question. I think it is there in everybody's mind and, and, and rightly asked. Um, uh, so I, I was in a meeting with um, uh, USBIC, US Business India Council. Uh, you know, at the end of the session, like we were thinking that we will have some takeaways for us uh, to hear that they are going go back to uh, US and, and, and maybe what to do is to say, advocate sensible immigration policies with Trump. Uh, what, what I have taken home back is that they said that uh, please go back to your, com your government and your industry bodies and request them and to push back and, and reach out to Trump to, <laughs> to, uh, to, sensible, uh, you know, to sensitize the same to see if there can be any impact. So I think um, uh, in, 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 in a lighter note, if I had to say, uh, maybe um, you know, uh, partly or most of it uh, from the US side as well is everybody is looking at, can somebody go and tell Trump? So uh, I think the way of approach to be is to go back and tell him in all possible ways to make him understand. <laughs> Satya? Uh, I think uh, it is not that we are not making uh, efforts to do that. At the government level, yes, government of India is doing a lot on that. <laughs> Uh, clubbed with all the chambers of commerce, they are trying to uh, convey our feelings on, hey, what is happening on whatever uh, Mr. Trump you are talking. So a lot of things have been happening, uh, but uh, knowing Trump, uh, I can just tell you a joke about uh, that as like when he moved to the White House and <laughs> I just connected with some of their friends and uh, he said uh, he's constructed a kind of a sleeping chamber, so he goes into that, and he has a wonderful dream, and he comes out to his balcony in the morning, and then he gives his daily ultimatum. So <laughs> this is how we. It's go. called prophecies. So we all know that. It's called prophecies. Ravi, R, your comments. We've got a minute to go. I need to come back to each of you for about ten seconds. First of all, uh, this is something that I've got back from my business as well as, and I've been discussing with our peers, right? What has really changed? We have heard a lot of noise. From a policy perspective, there has been no change. So now I got back to business. We all went back on a defensive, saying we will not do these things. We'll be compliant. We'll do all this. And a year later, nearly a year later, you're going back. 
asking what has changed. You told us so many things, nothing has changed. So why are you still pushing us, just thinking these, go these things are going to change? So while there is a pushback, there is a lobby mechanism, I don't think so. The policies are really going to change so much that it's going to be a huge impact or a dent because it needs to pass through. It's just not one man's decision. That's one. Secondly, I think the immigration policies, it's not only Trump. You go back and look at every other country. There is a similar kind of push. So it's not going to change much. We will do what we need to do. But I don't think the changes will be something that will dent the entire industry because it doesn't only hurt us, it hurts them also. Great, and I see that we're out of time, but I'd like a one sentence from each one of you. What should the audience take away from you guys? One sentence. I haven't thought it through. Okay, you're last. Satya, next. One sentence. Uh, be compliant and think ahead. That's great. Uh, I think people need to ask the questions. Please ask, because we tend to make decisions on what we assume is the case. So please ask the right people, and get the answers before you make a decision. Sure. Ravi, you had time to think? <laughs> no, I'm ready. Yeah. Uh, All right, I'll give, my, I'll, I'll give my one sentence. I think I agree. Be compliant, ask questions, interact with the right people. Absolutely, I agree with you. Uh, just to add, uh, take a position and move on. You, you can't be debating all the time and, and uh, you know, uh, bringing minds to talk about the same thing over and over again. Uh, take a position and move on and face it. That's it. Thank you so much, folks. Appreciate your being here towards the end of the day.